Hello, my name is Dr. Susan Robbins. I'm the class's comparative human behavior theory. Hello, class. Say hello to the viewing audience of the future. Hello. Okay. Today we have a special treat. We have two guest lecturers who are part of this class. Um, and we're going to be talking about several different things. We're going to be talking about gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to hear a long list of, of acronyms here about um, human development, growth and development in that population, issues specific to that population. Um, because the term transgender encompasses so many different people and orientations, I think that's a good way to put it, um, and so many differences, we're going to be talking about what we mean by that term transgender, because immediately people think, oh, we're talking about transsexuals. And the answer is yes, and the answer is no. Yes, we are talking about transsexuals, but we're also talking about other types of transgendered persons. Um, so what happens for political reasons, for political power, essentially groups who are very, very different in many ways tend to get lumped together. And we'll be talking later on today about the fact that because of these differences, it creates a lot of conflict. Because people have their own identities and they say, but we're different than them. We're different than them. So today, we're going to start with Josephine Titsworth, who's going to be talking to you about what she calls the transgender umbrella, describing to you what the various terms are. And then the second half of the class, Dr. Jolyn Miko, who's here from UT San Antonio, School of Social Work there, is going to be talking to us about gay and lesbian development and the developmental stages and whether or not those stages actually make sense and what the issues are specifically for men and women, because the issues in development really are different in that population. So let's welcome Josephine Titsworth. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to the uh, PowerPoint for a second here. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> you can come back to me now. I, I, I'm a little uh, not used to uh, uh, talking to a class and working a PowerPoint with a camera. So we'll work together on this. Before we really get started, I want to lay some ground rules. And the primary ground rule here is, is that you can ask me any question you want to ask me. And I will answer any question you ask me as best I can. Don't be shy, because if you're thinking it, you need to ask it. All right? And I'm here to answer those questions. This is my field of study. I'm a, a PhD student here in the social work program at U of H. And, uh, and Dr. Robbins is going to be my chair. So we have to impress her. Uh, let's uh, go to the uh, PowerPoint. And uh, I want to kind of go over some acronyms real quick. We have male to female, which is MTF. And we're going to be using these terms, so we are going to need to go over this so you understand. I'm retired from IBM, and IBM is well known for acronyms, even in their name. It's an acronym. It stands for I've Been Moved. <laughs> <coughs> and then you have, uh, what was the next one there? FTM. It's female to male. And then you have SRS. It's uh, Sexual Reassignment Surgery. Now, the next acronym is a really new acronym. It's very, very new. And it's sexual corrective surgery. And you're not going to see that acronym very much in the literature because it is so new. But this is the language that's being used in court documents these days for transsexuals. Yes, ma'am. What's the um, third acronym? The third acronym down was SRS. And that stands for Sexual Reassignment Surgery. Okay? And so Sexual Corrective Surgery is a new acronym that's being used by lawyers across the nation whenever uh, they go through getting legal documents for transsexuals. And then you have uh, GOBTIQ. There's also another letter that goes on there. It's A, but it's not on the slide. And A stands for allies. So it's gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersexed, questioning. 
And this is still a very fairly new alphabet soup uh, that was uh, generated back in 2005 at a summit here in Houston at the George R. Brown Convention Center. And so uh, we're going to move on now to the umbrella. Next slide is, you want to show the slide? Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> transgender umbrella. It's derived from Latin. The word transgender comes from Latin, where trans uh, means cross. And to give you a brief definition of transgender, and I want you to kind of open this concept up if you can, is Western society has a dichotomy, male, female, man, woman. And it's very structured dichotomy that exists. Transgender is when an individual crosses this invisible barrier from man to woman or woman to man, whether it be in behaviors, actions, uh, personalities, um, expressions, anything that crosses over that barrier is considered transgender. So now if you open your mind up a minute about the umbrella and what Dr. Robin said at the beginning, yes, it's transsexual, and no, it's not transsexual. Think of the different ways that definition can fit in our society right now. And we're going to talk about those things. So you can switch back to me now. Uh, transgender, like I said, comes from Latin. And trans means a cross. And so we can go back to the slide so students can follow. But it also, let's try and put the word together here. Sexist. Those of you, how many people have studied uh, Spanish or Latin? Any of those languages? If you have, raise your hand. Okay. You'll know that they have the masculine and the feminine in the language. U.S. is masculine. A is feminine. Same thing with Latin. And so sexus is gender in Latin. Sexa is gender in Latin, but on the feminine side. So <clears throat> if we keep working with this, then we go to vestio. Vestio means uh, to adorn or dress or dress. And so if we take all these words and kind of play with them a little bit, transsexus, transsexa, uh, transvestio, uh, transgender, uh, cross-gender, transsexual. You can kind of play with these words a little bit. And then you come to transvestite too. So you can play with these words. And you can see how the word derived from Latin. Are you okay with that so far? Okay, that, we're going to go to the next slide. Okay, there we are. And where am I at? Okay, yeah. Here's the first category under the umbrella. How many people here personally know a cross-dresser or a transvestite? Three, four, five, six. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like to get some input from y'all. What did y'all? What do y'all think about that? Talk to me. I want y'all talking to me. What do y'all think about cross-dressers? Go ahead, Linda. I think it's fine. Think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. My only experience with them was many years, many years ago, uh, going to shows, and they were absolutely wonderful. It was very entertaining. So that's. I'm sorry. It's kind of a sh small experience, uh -huh. but that's my experience with it. And I thought it was wonderful. They were incredible actresses, and. Uh, yeah. I liked it. I thought it was incredible. Well, see, now you bring up a really interesting point here. You can switch back to me now. You bring up a really interesting point now because you're talking about the entertainer. And we're going to discuss this, too, in, in this uh, vernacular under the transgender umbrella because, actually, a, the entertainer is not a cross-dresser. All right? They do that for entertainment. Now, granted, there are some cross-dressers that will do it. I personally know one who's a retired chief from the Navy who does it for drinking money. 
and uh, he's pretty good at it. <laughs> he showed me his fingernails one time. They were about yay long. So you know about yay long? And he made them out of copper tubing. Did not want to meet this person in a dark alley. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you have cross-dresser, transvestite, transgenderist. Those are terms that fall under the category of cross-dresser, transvestite. Uh, let's go to the slide. And so uh, we should be... Let's go to another slide here. There we go. That's where we should be. Uh, the transgenderist. That's somebody who dresses full-time in the opposite sex. Now, it could be either a cross-dresser or a transsexual, and we'll get to that definition of transsexual in a minute. But it, a transgenderist can be a cross-dresser or a transsexual. The difference being is a cross-dresser doesn't have conflict between their perception of their sex and their anatomy. There's no conflict there. All right? And so, uh, we'll just go to the next slide. You want to show that slide? Thank you. Uh, which transgenderists, which I've just tried to explain to you, um, they live full time. I've known uh, cross dressers who are transgenderists, and I've known transsexuals who are transgenderists. And in a minute, when we get to transsexuals, I want to kind of talk to you about that a little bit, a little bit more, a little more in depth. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide now. The term cross-dresser is politically correct. The term transvestite is technically correct. A cross-dresser does not necessarily like to be called a transvestite. Although transvestite is an accurate word for a cross-dresser. Its, its definition is the same. Over time in society, sometimes words get used in certain ways. To where eventually it gets to the point it carries with it connotations that some people may view as negative. So the word changes to a more appropriate, more sensitive word uh, to where the person just feels better uh, identifying with that particular word. And that's the case here. A cross-dresser is more comfortable being called a cross-dresser rather than a transvestite. It means the same thing because we went over it in Latin, right? means the same thing. And so let's go to the next slide. And which one is that? Now we're going to talk about transsexual. The transsexual. The transsexual, you have different categories of transsexuals. The non-operative transsexual is also a transgenderist. Now I told you we we're going to talk about that for a minute. First I want you to take a guess at what a transsexual is. I want to see someone t volunteer. Go ahead, Ashley. My guess is that a transsexual is somebody who trans, which means across, means cross their sexes, maybe? Okay. Like from male to female, from female to male? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. That's very good. And there's a reason they do that. There's a reason they cross over. And that deals with their perception up here in their brain of their identity, of who they are, conflicts with the construction, the anatomy of the human body. It's in conflict. You've got conflict going on. Whereas with a cross-dresser, that conflict doesn't exist. Transsexually, it does exist. So my question to you is I'm telling you that a non-op transsexual... Wait a minute non-op transsexual. Now, why would someone be a transsexual and be non-operative? Why would they not want to get surgery to correct the anatomy? Yes? I'm guessing insurance doesn't cover that. Most insurance does not cover that. It's just very expensive. It is very, very expensive. That is correct. Uh, also, I happen to know one who's a hemophiliac. So we can have medical reasons too. Because this person can never have surgery. And also, the person may be just so afraid of surgery 
that they no no I'm I'm okay the way I am so we can have some phobias here too so it is and it's really important that y'all understand the non-op piece of this I'm gonna give you an example of why let's say for example a non-op transsexual goes to college it's going to need to live in the dorms all right the person has legal documentation documenting them as being of the opposite birth sex they've been legally transitioned but yet because they haven't had surgery they might be denied access to the dorms appropriate for their gender you see what I'm getting at and it may it the ability for them to have surgery may not be an option for them but yet they have a consequence here it I really have a lot of empathy here for the uh, non-op yes ma'am uh, Jean Ann okay how do you legally transition how do you legally transition so that's a legal thing where you transition from one sex to another uh, you can you let me take your hand off now. <laughs> Uh, you can uh, uh, legally transfer by going through the courts. Uh, there, there's research to support the concept of having a, for example, a female brain and a male body. And in order to correct that, you go through transition. And in court, the judge will rule in court. Uh, the first time you go to court is so you can get your name and gender marker changed because the W path requires and most therapists and surgeons require this, requires the transsexual who's transitioning to live full time for a certain period of time. Because once you have surgery, there's no going back. And so they have to go through this process. So in order to start that, the courts have to allow that person to be designated as a male or a female on their documentation in order to be able to function. And so it, it's, a, it's a legal process. Uh, did I answer your question? Okay, all right. Well, let's kind of go on here. Uh, let's see where we're at now. Okay, here we go. Uh, <clears throat> like I've been telling you, uh, transsexuals struggle with the identity. In the beginning, prior to surgery, mostly non-ops and uh, pre-ops struggle with identity issues. Identity is up here. Your brain tells you who you are. For example, uh, you're a woman and your sex is female. You identify as woman. I'm, I'm supposing that's the case. See, I'm taking an assumption here. I'm making an assumption. I could be wrong. could be wrong. But I don't think so. <laughs> she says I'm not wrong. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> because of that conflict, this is why we need to understand this population. Now, I'm going to kind of briefly do a back step here for a second. The largest category under the transgender umbrella is cross-dresser. According to the Society for the Second Self, one in 20 men cross-dress. Now think about how many guys are on this campus. Do the math. Okay? Now we really don't think very much about women cross-dressing because women can wear guys' clothes in public. No one really thinks a whole lot about that. But when a guy wears women's clothes in public, it creates chaos. Society has to start thinking outside the box, and they don't like getting outside the box. And so, I'd like for you to keep that in mind, too. So let's get back to where we were. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we're talking about these definitions up here, and transsexual. Um, as you can see from the PowerPoint, they are concerned about their maleness or femaleness that may be in conflict with their bodily construction. You all with me so far? All right, I'm going to go to the next slide now. All right, here, where are we at now? Oh, yeah. 
transsexual, there's two different kinds of transsexual categories, even though they have non-op, pre-op, post-op. That's also divided up in two more categories, primary and secondary. Primary is when a transsexual, and by the way, this also can apply to a crossdresser. In, in, in certain ways, it can apply to a crossdresser. Primary is when a transsexual discovers at a very early age. Now, research shows right now the majority of people in the transgender community know at an early age, before age 10, that something's going on. There's something's there. They may not be able to tell you what it is or explain it, but they know something's going on. And so primary is uh, uh, at an early age. You, you, you know something's there. Secondary is at a later age. There's people that go through life and they don't even realize that this is a latent, con uh, 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 I don't want to say condition, but uh, this is something just resides in them. And they're not aware of it. And then suddenly it's triggered at a later age. And then they have to start the transition process at a later age. Linda. What would that age be? I knew. I was waiting for that question. And I'm so glad you asked that question. Here's a little bit of gray area here. Where do we draw the line between early and later? Because it's going to be kind of hard to do. If I say 30 years old, well, I don't know. Some people, that's later. For, for the purposes of understanding this, I like to say that uh, this pre-adult. But for later, I like to say later middle age and uh, higher. But then what do you do with the people in the middle? What do you do with them? I don't have an answer for the middle people. I don't have an answer. For, I have not seen a definition for the people that fall in the middle. I have not seen the definition. Be a good research project. Yes, Dr. Robbins. I think the big distinction, the big distinction here has to do with primary means that people know as they are growing and developing at ages as early as three, four, five, six that they are born into the wrong body. Secondary is anybody who doesn't experience that, and it's, as Josephine is saying, it comes much later, and it could happen at any point in adulthood. There have been several recent um, very good television shows of interviews with parents and children, parents who are raising transsexual children, um, and these children at the ages of three, four, five are really clear that they are born into the wrong body. So I would say if, if you're looking for ages, you're not going to find an age span among secondary, and the big difference is how early they know. Thank you. And real quick, I'd like to take a kind of a poll here. How many of you are interested in becoming clinicians? Raise your hand. Okay. How many children and families? That's another large group comes out of this program. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Children and families? Okay, all right, very good, very good. Do you realize that no matter what field of social work you go into, you're going to be exposed to the transgender population at one time or another? It's going to happen. I guarantee it will happen. Children and families, you're gonna have youth who are transgendered. And you need to try and at least know where to go to get the assistance you might need in order to work with those children. You don't just take transgender children and put them in gen pop. That's a correctional institution word. But uh, you just don't insert them into an area where they could be at, at uh, there could be some uh, problems arising for them. You have to think about the welfare of the child and go where the child is at that time. And it's hard to do sometimes whenever your personal value systems come in and maybe you don't uh, uh, accept or tolerate this behavior, but yet you have an obligation. 
It is now part of your code of ethics as a social worker. It's in the code of ethics. NESW adopted gender identity expression in the code of ethics last August during the delegate assembly. I participated in that process. So let's go to the next slide. Any questions so far? Any questions? All right. We'll go to the next slide. How many people have heard of this category before? Intersexed and hermaphrodite. Okay. All right. Have you ever known anybody who was like this? Actually, the most interesting person I ever met that was like this was someone who had fled communist Russia, escaped communist Russia, had been a member of the KGB, and in Russia, had, was forced to live as a male in Russia, and when he got to the United States, he became she. She had the genitalia, but it was ambiguous. It was ambiguous. So let's go see what this means. Next slide. What does this mean? Hermaphrodite intersex is anyone starting, kind of think of a, a, a spectrum or a continuum here. Anyone over here with ambiguous chromosomes? Now which chromosome do you think I'm talking about? Push the button. X and Y. XX, XY. They could have XXY, XYY. It could be a variety. It could, the configuration can be different. It's an anomaly, anomaly uh, in the biological world. It happens. So anywhere from ambiguous chromosomes all the way over to having both primary and secondary male and female characteristics and anything in between. Any combination of that in between falls under hermaphrodite and intersexed. And here again, we have politically correct and technically correct. Polit politically correct is uh, intersexed. Technically correct is hermaphrodite. And people who are intersexed do not really like to be called hermaphrodites. But they are okay with being called intersexed. Next slide. All right. Aha. Entertainers. Jean Ann? Jeannie. Jeannie? 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you had mentioned this earlier. Entertainers, drag kings, drag queens, female impersonators, male impersonators, they are what it says entertainers. The majority of them, their sexual orientation is gay. The majority. Not all. So don't make assumptions here. Alright. Cross-dressers. 80% of the cross-dressers are heterosexual. That violates a stereotype right there. Okay. So, uh, let's go to the next slide here. And I lost my page. Ah. I like this category. Uh-huh. How many people here have known people who either in the way they dress, the way they act, they talk, or they present or express themselves that don't match the sex? Raise your hands. We, more or less, we've all run into people. We've all run into guys who have feminine... Uh, 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 actions in the way the way they move about blah 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 and women who have more of a masculine presentation we've all met people like this we all know people like this now getting back to the definition of transgender anyone who crosses that barrier is transgender I get a lot of flack on this one on uh the masculine feminine, female and the feminine male. I get a lot of flack from the gay community on this one. Because they don't identify as transgender. But if you look at the definition, 
The definition says yes. I have a real good friend who is a uh, masculine female. And her and I have really got into discussions on this. And, but we understand what we're trying to do here so that the public in general can get a concept. And she's okay with that. But I dare not call her transgender. Dare not. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. Any questions so far? Yes, Linda. I have a question about, okay, like the feminine male, you've heard the term metrosexual because mm -hmm. it's a male who, you know, mm -hmm. appears to be feminine. So is that real, would that still be transgender? Would you, would you consider them crossing that barrier? Yes. So yes. what's your answer? Okay, so yeah, they would be considered. Now th this person wouldn't like that, but you know, like the label of that, but yeah, but technically it would be correct. Technically you're right. You're absolutely correct. And it's just like the masculine females and the feminine males. They don't necessarily want to be classified as transgender, but if you look at the definition, they cross that barrier. Jeannie. I'm sorry. Um, don't do, be sorry, be happy. Do those people, the, the male, female, or the, the masculine female, or the female masculine, is there some thing in the brain that has been proven? Of, they always... Uh, make me very curious. I have a very mm -hmm. good friend who is male and very feminine and I don't understand it. If okay. there is something in their brain do, or I mean a lot of people tell me all the time and I try to defend it that he wants to be gay but he doesn't dare come out. That he wants to be right gay. Mm -hmm. But he's been married He, but he's very feminine and I don't know how to explain it or what that is. There is some research. There is some medical research. Uh, the most popular one, uh, if you were to go look in and, and do some digging for research, would be a study, a brain study done by Dr. Zhao over in Europe. And this is back in the mid-90s when this study was done. <clears throat> what, what he did is he took uh, 20 corpses. You've got to be dead to do this, by the way. <laughs> you got to be just flat dead. Uh, and he, he dissected the brain. And he went to a specific area within the hypothalamus. And the area he went to, the acronym is called BTSC. Now I dare not say the medical word, it's yay long, and I would really ruin that word. So we'll stay with the acronym, BSTC. And he measured them. Now, he had heterosexual males who identified as males. He had heterosexual females who identified as females. And he had transsexuals who were male to female. Remember the acronym MTF? They were MTF. So he took that B BSTC and he physically measured it. And he took the male the male had a BSTC. I'm really exaggerating, folks, okay? We got this huge microscope that's really blowing it up here. Had a BSTC by yay big. And he took the female who identified as female, BSTC, and it was by yay big. See the difference? There's a big difference between the two. And then he went to the MTF, took the BSTC, measured it, and it was like the female. So my answer to you, Jeannie, is that even though we don't have any concrete uh, research to say, yes, this is it, there is research out there to suggest it's possible. And so if you take gender as if it's from the brain, it all originates in the brain, then it would be affected by the construction of the brain. Have I answered you? But what about the people who are male by gender, don't feel that they have a conflict, but mm -hmm. act feminine? And what I'm trying to say here... That there could also be a is, yeah, it, Right. Okay. It's all part... The Gender comes from the brain. Okay. And, your, and your behaviors, your personality, uh, how you interact, comes from the brain. That is the greatest organ. Dr. Robbins? I've got my mic on. One of the things that's important to, to remember is that when you're working on cadavers, it's hard to tell cause and effect. Is it because they are thinking and acting like a female that changes the brain? Because the brain is a very <coughs> elastic organ. 
or did it start that way? We have no way of knowing. The other thing to keep in mind is that the mind and the brain are two different things. The brain is the organ and the mind is the seat of consciousness. Obviously it's brain processes that cause consciousness, but how people think about themselves is not only a function of the brain, but it's also a function of the mind. So just be aware that there's always environment, brain interaction that's going on. And maybe someday we'll have some better answers, but at the moment we don't. And the bigger question is, who cares? <laughs> Why should we care? Except that we do because there is massive discrimination against people who are sexually variant or gender variant. Okay, let's go to the next slide. You can show the slide right here. Now, I've only covered definitions. I've only covered the definitions of just a few of the categories that fall under the transgender umbrella. Uh, Linda, you brought up metrosexed. Falls under there, but I didn't cover it. Uh, there's gender queer. There's all kinds of categories that fall under this. So you just have the ones you would see most often. All right, uh, there are many other categories as this says. Uh, next slide. This is the umbrella. Uh, I developed this umbrella. I used uh, data to justify the umbrella. But uh, this is the umbrella. This will help you visualize the concept of the different categories. A cross-dresser is not a transsexual, and transsexual is not a cross-dresser. But yet they're both transgender. I like to tell people, uh, a transsexual is transgender, but a transgender is not always a transsexual. And if you look at the umbrella, you see that. It's just it's a visual image. You get to see that. But I really want to cover one particular point here that I really want you to get a clear understanding on, and that sex does not equal gender. Sexual orientation, sexual identity is not the same thing as gender identity, gender orientation. What I'm going to present to you here is that sex is an anatomical construct. It's the construct of the human body. Anatomical construct. Gender is a biopsychosocial construct. And I say bio because I have to take into account some of the biological studies of the brain. So I have to take that into account, the thinking process. So biopsychosocial construct, that's two different constructs. Now society, the dominant social construct, says they're the same and utilizes them as the same. You fill an application out that says, what's your gender? <laughs> Don't give me that application. <laughs> because I will tell them what the gender is. If they want to know what sex is, I'll tell them what the sex is. That was before I had surgery, okay? <laughs> People will do that. So you need a clear understanding that it's different. And in no way does this concept threaten womanhood or manhood. That's not the issue. The issue is the definition. How do you define them? You define sex as an anatomical construct. It's physically. Uh, you're born with a penis or a vagina or whatever combination thereof for intersex people. And your brain identifies to you who you are, how you react, your personality, is generated from the thinking process in your brain. That's gender. Any questions on that? Okay, awfully quiet. Suddenly awfully quiet. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. If you can show that. And I really want, here's one way to get this across. This was a study done, and they looked at transsexuals on this study and examined the sexual orientations. If you look at the percentages across the board there, it's pretty reflective of society in general. Fairly reflective. You can't say a person's gender identity, gender uh, sec orientation defines their sexual orientation or sexual identity. Look at the chart. You can't do that because it's very diverse. Yes, Megan. When you're talking about those statistics there, is that um, considered 
it, based on the new gender identity, correct? So after you've transitioned, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual. Uh, this author that uh, put this chart up, this author um, identified that chart as being post-transition based on that. And so this kind of give you, and this is transsexuals, not cross-dressers, transsexuals after transition. Okay? And notice the P and the S. Who wants to tell me what that stands for? Where's the hand? Ah! Primary and secondary. You are good. You get a gold star for the day. Okay? <laughs> Make sure she gets an A. <laughs> and so, uh, the author took that into consideration too. Megan. Um, and then also, um, do you have any information on how often people's sexual orientation changes or does it generally, like if you were attracted to men, do you generally stay attracted to men or how often does that change after you transition? Because I've heard stories of people who transition and then become bisexual or maybe even switch. Uh, for the most part, most times, sexual orientation it, do you believe sexual orientation is you're born with it? If you believe that, then the sexual orientation does not change. Now, within the uh, transgender community, or the transsexuals especially, when they transition, some of them will say, the dominant social construct says this. I don't want to buck the system. I'm going to be this. And they'll go against their grain. Some do that. And they, some do lead a happy life that way. But for the most part, sexual orientation doesn't change, but the label does. For the most part. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, questions? Because we're fixing the clothes here, folks. But I have to show you my picture. Slide, please. I, I love that picture. I know people that look like that. And they were born and identified as male when they were born. To let you know how things are nowadays, when I went to court after surgery, federal dist I mean state district judge ruled that when I was born, I was accidentally, mistakenly misidentified as a male at birth. You have to kill me to look at my brain. Yeah, I, I know. I don't want to die yet. <laughs> and so, uh, the judge ruled that I should have been a female, identified as female when I was born. So I'm going to posit to you, right now, I can legally marry a man or a woman in the state of Texas. This is one of the reasons why SCS is important, because it's corrective. Uh, only got a few minutes left. Any last minute questions? I left you. I left you hanging, didn't I? <laughs> uh, if you have any other questions, Dr. Robbins. DSM, because that's on your slides. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Part of the slides we had here was for a gender identity disorder, GID. Uh, slide, please. Uh, gender identity disorder. That's a diagnosis in the DSM. Next slide. That's a diagnosis in the uh, DSM. Those of you who are going to be clinicians, you'll, you'll grow to that DSM. And I will kind of fly through this for a moment. Uh, and if I hit something you want to ask a question, stop me. All right, because we're running out of time. And it's... The transition for a transsexual, only a transsexual is going to have GID, by the way. The issue for the transsexual is that they have to go through this. They have to go through this transitional process, whether they get surgery or not. They have to go through the transitional process. When, when they wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, they don't see the sex they may present as. They don't like what they see. Because internally, that's not what they are. So that you see that conflict going on? It does exist. Last minute questions. 
What did it take the judge to to uh, tell say that you were born a uh, I'm all confused now a mm -hmm. female that you were not a male right that's what mm -hmm. he determined how did he come to that it's based on existing research okay and I, I just explain one of them to y'all okay. okay yeah it was all based on existing research I want to thank everybody Dr. Robbins thank you for inviting me it's been a pleasure Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, Dr. Robinson knows how to get a hold of me. <laughs> any last minute questions for Josephine before she leaves? Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, let me have the clicker back. Thanks. Let me just change PowerPoints real quickly. Undressing. Uh huh. Okay. We're transitioning now to something else. <laughs> this is all part of, of a similar lecture because it's dealing with very, it's dealing with essentially issues of gender, issues of sex, and people who are seen as sexual minorities for a variety of reasons. Okay. So next we're going to hear from Dr. Jolyn Miko, who's going to be talking about, well, let, let's go through what we've heard so far. Most of you are familiar with the acronym GLBT, right? Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered. You can read more about developmental theories in the textbook. Josephine gave us two new letters, intersexed, GLBT, I, intersex, do you now understand what that means? And Q for questioning, because some people really are questioning. They are not quite at that point. So now we're going to be dealing, in the second part of the lecture, with some of the prevalent theories about gay and lesbian identity, and some of the things you need to know about the gay and lesbian population that is slightly different. Dr. Julian Miko. Please, let's welcome her. Where's the other microphone? Is it up there? Could you, could you switch the microphone? Ah. The switch them to mic, sure. I'll have to change mics. Mm -hmm. Right here in front of everybody. Let's <laughs> <laughs> okay. turn this off. Oh, there it is. Okay. Technical. <clears throat> a technical pause. <laughs> okay. Does that work? Am I live? Okay. You're live. <laughs> well, am I live somewhere out Excuse there? Me, <laughs> yes, you're live. Okay. <laughs> It's glad I exist out of this room. Let's forward this back. Okay. Um, my name is Jolyn Miko, and I am a licensed master social worker. I also have my PhD in social work. I got my PhD here at the University of Houston. I want to give you a little background about who I am. I'm going to really talk to you and center on talking to you about gay and lesbians. And I realize that you just had someone in here that, that gave you a pretty big broad discussion about um, basically gender presentation variance. Because we're talking about when things don't exactly match the heterosexual concept of what should be going on. And I want to really focus on gay and lesbians. And first of all, I need to tell you, I am a lesbian. Um, I have a son who is gay, and he lives in California, is married to his partner. Um, my, I have an oldest son who is heterosexual, and he's a cowboy and works in the Big Bend. And um, then I have a daughter who is heterosexual, and she lives in San Francisco. Um, and we are all one happy family with the addition of my partner and her daughter. So my daughter and her daughter view themselves as sisters. And if you see us together as a family, 
Um, we don't look very much different from any other family. Um, but my daughter has come through a real process of trying to, you know, she dates and she meets people and the relationship and her and my older son get to a certain point and then we have to discuss family. And I've had them, my son come to me and say, Mom, I don't know how to talk about this. And my daughter has been very militant and forceful. You can accept me, you will accept my family. But she will come to me afterward and she said, Mom, you know, it doesn't feel strange when I'm living in it, but when I go to explain to somebody about it, they, I can tell by the way they look at me it feels really strange. Because in addition to all of that, I was married for 13 years to a uh, Presbyterian minister, and my partner was married for a number of years to a man. And so they have also those step-siblings, and all that encompasses their extended family. So we, she has struggled with this in trying, she accepts it at normal, but she recognizes that when she explains who her family is and what her father does and what her mother does and what her other mother does, that sometimes other people have a difficult time hearing it. So I wanted to explain that to you up front. And what I want to talk to you about is gay and lesbian identity. Um, and that is gay males and lesbian identity. One of the things I want to stress to you is there is a sex that we are born with, with the exception of intersex. We're born male or female. But our gender is performance. There is no gender. Who you are as far as gender identity is how you perform that identity for everyone out there that's looking at you. You have all known, and the previous speaker talked about, you've all known females that present more masculine. And you've known males that present more feminine. So what I want to ask you to think of right now, if we think about that, what is male? Anybody got an idea? Somebody tell me, what is male? It's all, what, tool belts and beer and pickup trucks? <laughs> what is male? And then what, if, if you can identify, what is female? What is female? It's performance. It's how you walk, it's how you talk, it's how you present yourself. That's gender. And that's your gender identity. And there are individuals within the gay and lesbian community that present as normal as any heterosexual you've ever known. And those people basically don't have a lot of problems, but those people that present in a more feminine or masculine way have more problems because of their presentation. Gender is performance. <clears throat> we tend to think of identities as fixed and unchanging. And that's not the case. We tend to come to who we are as sexual beings like we come to who we are as a number of other things. Who I am as a student, as an intellectual, as someone that likes education. Who I am as a member of my family. And who I am as a sexual being, they're all processes and we all explore. We don't wake up one morning and decide, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to be about, and this is who I'll always be. How many of you decided very early, as you graduated from high school, you were going to become a social worker. And for others of you, when did you make that decision? It was very recent for me. Very recent, as a result of? Things that went in my li on in my life, my divorce and things like that. Okay. How about some of the others? Megan, when did you become, how, why social work? Um, it's something that I had considered when I was in college and then um, kind of decided to go a different path. And I'm actually co-enrolled in law school in social work, so um, 
it's been in the last few years that I've decided for sure. So you can see that your career paths vary. We have some people that knew from the word get-go, other people that have recently come to it, and other people that considered it, traveled, made a journey, and have now returned to it in a different way. Sexual identity is very much like that. It is not fixed for most people. It's a journey we travel. It's a process. And there is a process of coming out. What we need to consider is, when we think of sexual identity, and I'm, I'm hopeful that you're all aware that up until the mid-1970s, homosexuality was considered a mental illness, right? Everybody know that? And with the stroke of a pen, it disappeared as a mental illness. Which means that something that we had formally thought of as this is a problem and this is the problem and this is how you fix it, now totally disappeared from the clinical arena. Leaving us to try to contemplate, okay, now if, if it's not a mental illness and if it's not in the DSM, then what is it? Is it normal? Is it not normal? Is this something that people are concerned about, not concerned about? It cre with, with, when the APA did that, they created a vacuum in how we think of homosexuality. Because prior to then, it was real easy for us to say it's a mental illness. There were men and women put in mental institutions for that very reason by their family, their friends, their parents. And now, all of a sudden, it's not. And the problem is, it left us with, well, if it's not a mental illness, then what is it? And the reason I have this here is because, depending on how you ask the question, it's going to frame the answer. If you ask a question about homosexuality and whether it is supported by Judeo-Christian tradition, that's going to frame how you answer that question. So depending on how you think about gender and sex and gender identity and gender orientation and how you question what it is, is going to frame where you find your answers. The central task for any social worker and certainly for anyone working with this population is trying to develop a true understanding of the lives of gay and lesbian people. And as with any other population, not everybody is the same. I have a gay son. He, his life, his coming out process, and mine were entirely different because of who he is and the time he grew up in and who I was and my journey in the time I grew up in. And it's really created sometimes some fairly amusing um, issues between the two of us. He knew I was gay. I was uh, determined to be at least honest and open within my home. And when he came to understand that he was gay and he would come visit me and he's 16 and a gay male and like any 16-year-old male, he wants to be around potential sexual partners, right? And he wants to party and he wants to go places. And he looked at me as his gay parent and decided I was also going to be to, to give him entree into the bar scene culture of the gay world. Because he popped up and said, Mom, can you take me to a gay bar? Let's go to a gay bar. And he's 16 years old. And I said, Son, <laughs> I'm not going to take you to a gay bar any more than I'd take your brother when he was 16 to a cowboy bar and drop you off. No, I'm not going to do that. But you're gay. I said, I'm your mother. <laughs> so he and I have had struggles with this because he looks at me and you're gay, Mom, you ought to understand this. I do understand this, but I also have another identity that is primary, and that is I am your mother. And I'm the one that has to, 
make sure that you have the values and you're guided and you have the things you need to be in successful adulthood and dropping you off at a bar at 16 I don't care whether you're homosexual or heterosexual is not something any mother ought to do <coughs> When you begin to look at sexual identities, when you have a sexual minority presentation and a sexual minority identity, it becomes a declaration of separateness because there is the presumption that homosexuality is compulsory. Many people assume that I am heterosexual because I have three children. They cannot conceive, and because I was married, they cannot conceive of the fact that I could be anything else but heterosexual. So there is that compulsory assumption. And when you declare that status, what you've done is you've taken basically a political act. Your personal issues have become political. And certainly in this day and time, they've become very, very political. Um, right now in California, they're trying to decide whether gay and lesbians can marry, and that's a valid marriage. My son got married to his partner, and they're sitting around waiting, trying to figure out whether they're going to be married this time next year because the last time San Francisco extended the right to marry to gay and lesbian couples, um, it was done by the city. And there were a number of individuals that got married. And when the state of California overturned the city's right to marry those couples, what the city did was send a letter to every couple they had married offering to them that if you're in letting them know your marriage has been annulled and if you will send us the marriage license back we will send you back the fee you paid us and so in a stroke of a pen individuals who had been married were now not married according to the state so all I'm saying is the personal becomes political those of you that have uh, committed relationships you go home to every night, those of you that those relationships are sanctioned by society and you are legally married, try to imagine that you go home tonight and for some reason, unforeseen reason, the state of Texas has declared marriage between a man and a woman legal, illegal. And you receive a letter in the mail telling you you are no longer married. What would your response be? Linda? Well, I would be outraged. And, and would, you, would you turn to your partner and say, oh my gosh, we're not married anymore, you've got to move? No. No? no? We've, you know, I don't know what we're going to do with our joint bank account, for gosh sakes. I'm going to have to get another name. With a stroke of a pen, with a letter. What once was recognized is now no longer recognized. That's a pretty tough thing to give up. And that's what makes that personal thing, uh, someone that you are committed to and love and want to spend the rest of your life with and want to share your income with and share the good times and the bad times with, that very personal thing becomes a political thing when you try to gain the rights and benefits of marriage and or keep them as in the state of California. Okay, let's go to the next slide. One of the differences between gay men and lesbian women is obviously being men and women. And we tend to take this population and lump them together and everybody's gay. And one of the things that I want you to remember when you think about this population is that lesbian and gay men often, one of the only things they have in common is their sexual minority status. That is, 
they are attracted to and want to be with those of the same sex because there are certain differences between gay men and their process of coming out and their process of couplehood and what they struggle in partnership with between the gay men on those issues and uh, lesbian women and I want to highlight some of that because they have gender differences and those gender differences work out in their partnerships. For males, many times that identity, the homosexual identity, they see as central to who they are. They see it as little choice. I was born this way. I've known I was this way all along. Um, sexual behavior and fantasy are very central to their sexual life. For females, homosexual identity is seen as more of a choice because of the way females relate to each other and to other people it's more relationship based and affectational based so the orientation sexual orientation really is part of my identity it's not it's sexual sexual expression of that is just one way, but it's only one way of my re way of relating to those that I feel close to and those that I love. Okay? Um, think of a male friend you may have and the way you relate to that male friend and think of a female friend you have and the way you relate to that female friend. Most probably you relate in different ways to those people although you feel close to both those individuals but the way you relate to them is different and what I'm saying is for homosexual men and homosexual women how they relate in relationship to that partner that they're drawn to to that because of their sexual orientation is different because of their male ness or their femaleness and how they see relationships. <clears throat> the Kinsey scale. This is something that Dr. Robbins wanted to go over with you. Um, yeah. This did very nicely um, with exactly what um, Jillian is talking about. The Kinsey scale, and then, um, Alfred Kinsey in the 1940s, did research on sexual orientation. And in the research, what they found is the following, is that some people are exclusively heterosexual. Other people are exclusively homosexual. However, there is a lot of variation in between that. And if you take a look, and, and these are scores that they give on the scale, so if somebody has scored zero, that means that they are exclusively heterosexual with no homosexual urges, fantasies, um, or leanings. Somebody scores six, they're exclusively homosexual. If somebody scores a three, we call that bisexual. They are equally heterosexual and homosexual. In other words, no specific preference and remember, this is not gender, this is about sexual orientation. Everybody clear about that? Okay, but what they also found, and this surprises people, because we tend to put people in these boxes and categories. What they also found is that separate from those three categories, there are other categories. So a category of one, there are some people that are prominently heterosexual, but only incidentally homosexual. In other words, if the opportunity comes along, it might or might not happen, but they are still primarily heterosexual. Another category, somebody who again is not truly bisexual, which is either or, is somebody who is predominantly heterosexual, but more than incidentally. And these are the exact words that they used. I just came across a term used in the kink community, which we'll talk about towards the end of this, um, called heteroflexible heteroflexible, and that would encompass scores one, two, and three. Actually, it would encompass scores one and two. So if, if you take that to its logical conclusion, some people are in fact homoflexible as well. In other words, primarily, in score of five, 
homosexual, but incidentally, they may have some heterosexual relationships. And then as you get closer to bisexuality, we have some people that are primarily homosexual, but more than incidentally. Okay, away from the slide and back to me for a minute. Uh, one of the things that I hope that you can see from this is that sexuality, one sexual orientation is not necessarily in these fixed, fixed, fixed categories of only being gay or being straight. And this thing called bisexual is something that, that the gay community even has a hard time with and the straight community has a hard time with. And I think if you take a look at, at the real world of human sexuality, um, there are always people that fall somewhere on this continuum. And yet, because there is so much discrimination against anything but heterosexuality, it is very, very hard for people, in a true political sense and an identity sense, to sometimes even admit that they have these other leanings. So this fits very nicely with what JoLynn was talking about. So I'm going to put this back, give this back to you. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions about that? And I really love the, the term heteroflexible, homoflexible, because what that says is that is that. And by the way, in this scale, the other finding is, uh, is that in general, gay men, not always, this is general, the majority of them are exclusively homosexual. The vast majority. The vast majority also tend to know it from an early age. Remember that Josephine talked about primary and secondary? In contrast, lesbian women, while some of them might be exclusively homosexual, many of them fall somewhere else on this scale. And what we see, and, and the, I think that you conveyed this very nicely, Jolyn, is that it's more, and by the way, this is not different than the heterosexual population. Even for straight men and straight women, men are more oriented towards sex in general. It probably has to do with biological differences, hormonal differences. And when women, what they're finding, what the most recent research is finding, is that women certainly are more flexible. Many women start off straight or in straight relationships. And then as they get older, for all of the relationship reasons and the affectional reasons that Jolyn has talked about, they change their orientation. Does that make sense to y'all? So women, in a sense, are much more flexible on the scale, much more so than men. Any questions about that? OK, back over to Jolyn. Are there any questions that you have of me before we go on any further? No. Well, I'm going to have to tell my kids that I finally, once in my life, was absolutely crystal clear. Nobody had any questions. <laughs> I want to talk about, because you're going to be working with gay male couples and lesbian female couples. And many times, um, certainly in the literature, they talk about how these are couples, they're committed, they're the same as everyone else. And what I want to highlight to you is differences, because there are distinct differences. Um, obviously, one of the main differences that you as someone working with a couple or a family where this is an issue need to remember is that there is a personal and a political dimension here over and above and beyond just the problems they might be having. Um, depending on where you live, depending on your environment, um, it can be a death-defying act to openly declare you're homosexual. It can be something that can cause you not only career Detri detriment, but also physical detriment. So you need to clearly understand that encouraging someone to get comfortable with themselves and to come out to friends and co-workers for many people is a death-defying act. And you need to be very, very careful on your counsel you give to anyone. Well, you know, you're carrying around all this guilt and the, all this secrecy and you just need to get rid of that and you're gonna feel better. They may feel better, but they may be injured, hurt, or lose their job the next day as well. You need to be very, very clear on this as you work with these families and couples 
because that's not being open and being honest with the people around you is not always in their best interest. Now, the problem that gay male couples experience is very much tied with the fact that you have two males that are in a relationship. And for most males, and I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm going to give you some gross generalizations. No, this does not apply to every single person. But it is a way to begin to think about these issues. For most males, in heterosexual relationships, there is a struggle between autonomy and intimacy. And that is often a um, issue in marital counseling for heterosexual couples is he doesn't talk to me enough. He isn't affectionate and you know, the whole thing. And the, the man will say, she hangs on me. She's driving me nuts. Okay, you understand that? And that's that tension between autonomy and intimacy. When you have two males that are both oriented toward autonomy, what do you think the issue is going to be in their uh, relationship that's going to come up over and over again? The lack, go ahead. I'd say uh, a struggle to be dominant, power struggles. There's power struggles and then they have to work very hard on intimacy because that's not generally the way that they're oriented toward relationship. You're right, there are lots of power struggles many times, and they have to really work at intimacy because it looks to you, if you are very have very heterosexual lenses, like these are two people kind of existing in the same house, but they don't seem to have a relationship. And that's because they are, being both males, that autonomy comes forward, that's what they lead with, generally. For females, that struggle is to maintain autonomy. For lesbian couples, there tends to be strong, quick, almost immediate intimacy and what some people would call unhealthy boundary violation. And so you, you work with lesbian couples many times around issues of maintaining your separate identities so that you can be who you are and come together as a couple because intimacy develops so quickly in a lesbian couple. There's an old joke, I'll tell you, in the gay and lesbian community and it goes like this. What does a lesbian woman take on the second date? A moving truck. <laughs> what does a gay man take on the second date? What second date? <laughs> and that just really is stereotypical, and I may pay for this later if anybody sees it, but it is true that females tend to bond very quickly, and men tend to take a very long time to come together, and they struggle with that. Now, we tend to see that struggle with power and autonomy as a bad thing. And we tend to see this immediate intimacy and the struggle to maintain separateness as a bad thing. The problem is we don't have any good theories or interventions that have really been tested because we have not, as a profession, spent very much time thinking about homosexual couples and how they might be different from heterosexual couples. What we tend to do is just overlay everything we know about heterosexuals onto homosexuals and just say, oh, well, the only difference is it's two women or it's two men. And what I maintain to you is that is not the only difference. There are differences in those couples and how they relate. And I don't think clinically or in interventions, we have really begun to take a real in-depth look at what really works with two females that are in a committed relationship and how that is different from two males that are in a committed relationship and how that is different from a heterosexual couple in a committed relationship. So what I'm telling you is it's always a good rule of thumb to apply clinical skills and, and be warm and engaging and develop rapport. 
but don't mistake the fact that just because you've worked with couples before um, that you know everything there is to know about what might be going on between two women in a committed relationship because there is a difference in that relationship and that's something we've not done much exploration of as a profession. I want to talk to you about the coming out process. Um, <clears throat> The coming out process obviously is coming out and recognizing that you are gay. And the first thing we need to recognize is this coming out process is kind of a linear model. You start here with you're denying it, you don't know it, and over here you're dancing up and down and singing kumbaya and saying isn't the world wonderful. And we tend to think of it as this linear process and it's not a linear process at all. There are very few processes in life that are linear and we need to understand that it may be fits and starts it may be great strides forward and something happens within the life context and we're right back where we started from before and it's a process that never ends never ends so let's go ahead and remember it is going along with all developmental processes so if you are remember when you were 12 you know, junior high, oh, and then 13, oh, and then 14, ah, right? And you were struggling to figure out who you were. Your parents had turned into total dweebs. Um, they were stupid, 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 right? And you, if you had brothers and sisters that were younger, they were stupid, stupid, stupid too. And then you were trying to figure out your place in school, who you were, the cool kids, the uncool kids. Am I in the in crowd, the second crowd, third crowd? Am I on the bottom of the rung? Uh, should I be smart? Should I not be smart? Should I be athletic? Should I not be athletic? Who will accept me? All those issues are going along, right alongside. And for those people that are heterosexual, you're coming to who am I? What is sex about? What kind of people am I attracted to? Is it the athletic guy? Is it the geeky guy? Is it the pretty girl? Is it the studious girl? Whatever. And for the homosexual teenager, all those tests are in there and they're also struggling with, I don't... Look, there is nobody else here around like me. I'm attracted to the quarterback of the football team and I viscerally know that I can't say that to anybody and yet I have to struggle with am I accepted am I not accepted if they present in a more feminine manner or a girl presents in a more masculine manner there's bullying that goes on there's taunting that goes on there's uh, not acceptance by certain in crowds in high school or the people that you desperately want to be accepted by so these all go in tandem as you are discovering who you are as a sexual being and discovering you are homosexual and what that means in society and you just turn on the TV Sunday morning or the news and you can find it any time and you're trying to develop and figure out who I am, what do I value, where do I want to go, um, what do I want to be when I grow up, what am I interested in, all that is going on at the same time. So those developmental processes, and that's over the course of your life. I am over, <clears throat> I am well into the fifth decade of my life. And I am doing things that I think most people do at my age. I'm thinking about retirement. Am I going to have enough money? How are my kids doing? What do I want to give them? How do I want to support them? I do some life review, you know, uh, enjoyed things that I enjoyed. Do I still enjoy looking forward to whatever it is I'm looking forward to? I'm doing all that kind of stuff. But in addition to that, I am in a relationship for over 25 years with another female and we live in a town where it is um, fairly conservative, there's a lot of military influence, and there's lots of fundamental evangelical mondo churches. And so we have to 
do everything that we're doing and doing it with our kids and all that we're going through at our work and our careers and gee they're looking at me I've got gray hair they might want to fire me and get rid of me and all that stuff and we also have to look at who we are as a couple in this context and in this environment fortunately for us our children accept us very well um, my partner's family is pretty good about it but there are some bumps in the road and my mother it has taken her 25 years to get to the point where she'd rather talk to my partner on the phone than me when she calls and that's been a long process of my mother not visiting in our home for over 20 years not setting foot across our doorstep so I that process of coming out and who you are and what you are and where you're going and how you're going to get there it develops right along with the process of who you are in your sexual identity oh dear that was not a good thing okay the stages of coming out the first stage is could I be homosexual oh my goodness my goodness my goodness this is going to kill my Catholic father this is going to kill everybody they're going to kill me right this is a real struggle the next is well you know I may be I mean I just I may be we're still not real open with the issue then it's well I probably am In fact I'm almost sure I am I, I really am and I know this and the fifth stage is identity and pride and then it is taking that identity and integrating it into all you are my son made the mistake of thinking because I am a gay woman and he is a gay teenager that I would automatically provide him entree into some kind of gay bar scene and what he didn't remember is I'd integrated who I am as a lesbian woman into who I am as a mother and that wasn't going to fly okay <clears throat> now one of the things I want to point out to you is you can see we got six neat stages here and we went from I, I don't think I can be to raw raw I am and it's just a part of who I am and that's a nice linear process but that's not the way it always works because every time you get a job you start the coming out process again who here is safe for me to come out to is this a safe place to come out at all every time you move into a new neighborhood you have to take a measure of where am I can we really be open and honest about who we are with the neighbors um, would that not be a good thing are we going to wind up with um, problems with our own physical safety every time we go into a store every time we go to a hospital emergency room there have been time in my life when I injured myself and was taken by the ambulance to the hospital my partner came in a car with my daughter and her daughter and I was in there and they were sewing up the back of my head and they would not allow my partner in the room they would not share any information with her they would not allow her to see me they would not provide her with any answers we have and any gay or lesbian couple that does not live in California and is not married has to have a stack of legal papers about this thick there is the medical power of attorney the real estate power of attorney the financial power of attorney there is the power of attorney that allows you to make medical decisions should your partner be incapacitated there's another power of attorney you have to have in place to take possession of the body as it comes out of the hospital because otherwise the family can come in and take the body if you die you have to have your will spelled out extremely specifically you cannot count on designating your partner as a beneficiary on anything because they're not a blood relative or to you nor are they married to you um, the um, fiduciary organizations don't have to agree to give that to your friend so you have to have paperwork to do that what happened to me in the emergency room was my daughter who was nine years old was allowed to come in and see me now you know 
that was traumatic for her because she didn't know and, and basically she came in and said mom Robin can't come in I don't know what to do and Robin meanwhile is running home to get the power of attorney and come back and she had to present them and force them to allow her in so I've lived in contexts like that so the coming out process is never neat and it's never finished even in my current employment everyone knows I'm gay but when I really begin to talk about my partner in our life, there are many times when they're very um, surprised at what they find. Something so simple as an anniversary date. My partner and I have been together for over 25 years. Somebody asked me, what's your anniversary date? And I said, well, you know we can't be officially married. And I said, you know, it really depends. We chose a date. But really, for most gay couples, when you ask them anniversary date, they have to go, okay, was it the first date? Was it the first sex? Was it when you first moved in? Was it when we both first said we loved each other? Because there is no official way to recognize this relationship. That recognition has to be created by the couple. So the coming out process is something that goes on for the rest of your life. I think that's it. Any questions, guys? Yes, Tony. Can you talk a little bit about like the emotional developmental delays for um, people that are gay and lesbian as far as like dating because they're always sort of held back from dating for right. so long. Right, and they're behind the curve. I mean, depending on when they finally recognize that, and for some people it's in their late 30s, some 40s, sometimes 50s, that's not so much anymore. But that whole hyperactivity with wanting to be around people and date people and everything and they're 60 years old and they're acting like a teenager, yeah, that occurs. For my son, his coming out process was certainly less fraught than mine. And he had a fairly normal dating process, kind of lots of guys and lots of different partners and different people but pretty much on developmental course with his generation right about 25 to 30 he found that partner and now he's married and that if you look at at statistics overall that's what most individuals do um, and we find like the the course of alcohol and drug consumption follows that same kind of curve and drops down as we get into late 20s to early 30s, mid 30s, because we have developed a life and responsibility and that kind of thing. Um, but for many people my age, that coming out process was fraught with all kinds of potholes. And you really, it, particularly if you were in areas that were very rural, there were few uh, other people who were gay around, once you moved to a big city, you just basically went berserk. I mean, because you could. And that was not possible before. Now, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, because I think a lot of times people in the GLBT community are stereotyped as being like promiscuous or so forth, you know, later in life because they never got that chance to date everybody in high school, college, maybe so forth. Yeah. And well, and the other thing is they're labeled that we have a different societal context now than we've had before. It is more accepted. I can go to, I, I have what I call the stare factor, um, kind of a, my own personal scale on cities, because I tend to present as more male. And if you see me in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt, I get addressed as sir a lot. And it is in cities where I, it, where, where I say it has the high sir factor. People aren't paying attention and they aren't looking. And I know it's a less accepting community than, say, San Francisco, where I can go and I look like a grandma compared to, you know, the drag kings I've seen. And, and there was a time when my kids wanted to run and hide under the bed. You know, my daughter would say, you're not wearing that, are you? Like, well, yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. okay thank you so much. Dr. Miko. <laughs> okay, I wanted to follow up with just a little bit of discussion. Um, 
again, I want to put this in context. We're looking at people who are variant, either by their sexual orientation, their gender expression. And one of the things you're going to find is that there has been massive discrimination on people who are different. We have, we, we've talked about this before. Part of our culture has to do with very strong norms about people being heterosexual, people presenting as the gender that they are biologically born with. And we have very little tolerance for not just gender variance, but also sexual variance. I had mentioned before that one of the terms in the kink community, let me define what I mean by, mean by that and why that's relevant to this discussion. What is now called the kink community, again, this is more the politically correct term, um, are people who have other kinds of sexual variations. People who practice bondage, discipline, sadomasochism, master-slave relationships. The reason that's relevant to what we're talking about today is, again, these are people who are sexually variant. Much of this, as Josephine talked about before, is in the DSM as being a psychiatric disorder. One of the things you will find in the kink community is that there are a lot of heterosexual cross-dressers. Because of societal taboos, many of them believe that they have to be quote-unquote forced to be feminized. Forced feminization, in other words, it's something they really want to do and don't have the nerve to do it, and they sometimes turn to other, other people, dominant people, to force them to do that. Many times, heterosexual men who are cross-dressers are people who feel more comfortable with people who are going to be more accepting of them, and they're going to find that kind of acceptance in the kink community. So what you're going to find as you're working with clients is not only gay and lesbian individuals, also bisexual individuals, transgender in every sense of the term, but also people that have other kinds of sexual orientations and identities that are also seen as being pathological. In the same way that, that Jill Lynn said, at one point, being gay was seen as a psychiatric disorder. And with the stroke of a pen, all of a sudden, it is not. With the stroke of a pen. There is, I, I mentioned this earlier, there is a lot of brouhaha going on in the transgender community right now. The DSM-5, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5, is being written. Uh, and there is a big fight in the transsexual community to get gender identity disorder taken out, removed entirely. Why do I say there's a big fight? What, what would you think? Who would they be fighting with? Let's start with this. If it's not in the diagnostic manual, how do we treat it? What about people who want sexual reassignment or sexual corrective surgery? Right now, you've got to have a diagnosis to be, even be able to get that. But yet, the diagnosis makes you psychiatrically unfit. The same thing, um, many cross-dressers, male cross-dressers, heterosexual cross-dressers, um, are fetishistic. In other words, the cross-dressing is their fetish, not as part of a gender identity, but they have Set, there's a sexual component to it. And that is also seen as being something that is quote-unquote abnormal. And yet it is what I'm going to call normal human sexual variation. The reason that there is so much brouhaha in the transgender community, the transsexual community, is the infighting. True transsexuals say, we are not the same as those cross-dressers. How dare they identify as part of the same community because we are so different. Um, I'm right now, I belong to several different discussion boards um, for professionals who are um, transgender and transsexual activists trying to get the DSM to change because we're calling something a mental illness that truly is not a mental illness. As Josephine talked to you about, it's probably something that is very biologically based. And yet there's a lot of brouhaha and fighting within, within the community with people who say, we are not them. In the same way that gay men are not the same as lesbian women, lesbian women are not the same as gay men, 
And then where do bisexuals fit? They're shunned by everybody because the gay community says they're really one of us. And guess what the heterosexual community says? They're really one of us because they're both. We, do, we simply fail to understand these differences. This is very important in your clinical work because it's important to be sensitive to people who come to you who are sexually or gender variant and not pathologize them and try to understand them from their own point of view. Now that does not mean that some of these folks don't have other psychiatric problems. Many of them do suffer from depression, very high rates of alcoholism, drug abuse, not necessarily because of their sexual orientation, gender orientation, gender expression, but many times because of the discrimination that they face and their inability or unwillingness to really be who they are. So these are just things for you to think about as you start doing, and whether, I don't care whether it's clinical work or whether you're going to be a program administrator, planning programs, it's very important to be sensitive to these differences and not pathologize them. Just as easily, with the stroke of a pen, people can be married and unmarried, people can be pathologized and not pathologized. And I think, as social workers, it's very important for us to be advocates for our clients so that they can lead healthy and normal lives. Any questions? We're very quiet today. No questions? Okay, then we'll see you all next week. <laughs>